Welcome back to the shop. What's wrong with your bobcat? Well, you're probably having actuator problems if you ended up here today. Either that or you're just interested to know more about these actuators and, and how they work. Um, I've got two actuators here, and that's all you'll have on your machine hooked to a... Uh, this is a D2 valve out of the latest M-Series machines. Um, but, but they're all going to work pretty much the same. Um, your, your bottom actuator is always going to be your lift and your top actuator when it's in the machine. Your top actuator or in the center portion of the valve is always going to be your tilt actuator. Um, let's see, so your machine's probably locked up and you've got some codes. Here's some examples of codes you would have. Um, tilt actuator fault, tilt actuator wiring fault, tilt actuator not neutral. Tilt actuator, short to ground, actuator short to battery, uh, reduced performance, uh, wrong direction codes. Now we were talking about not neutral, actuator fault, reduced performance, out of range low, out of range high. Anyways, you get the picture. So first thing we need to do is talk about how to remove your actuator from your valve. Um, so let's talk about the, the later style valves first, then we'll we'll move to this valve real quick. So um, I like to use a long 3 16 bit, depending on some of your machines, it can be hard. So uh, what we need to do is you're gonna have two screws on your actuator. One there. Let's see, there's one on the bottom. Those come out easy, but usually what you'll find is there's a bunch of junk, um, grease and all built up in the end of your um, your hex head, your Allen head screw there. It's, uh, you want to clean that out the best you can with a pick or something sharp because I don't know if you can see, but there's thread sealer Loctite from the factory on these. And if you don't get this thing in there really good and deep, it's possible you're gonna strip one of these out and then life really sucks at that point. All right, so you get your two screws out. All you gotta do is grab your actuator and pull it out and see it'll roll out and it'll give you access to the retainer pin right here. So I just use the same bit that I used to um, remove the screws or a long pick or something and uh, just push your retaining pin right out like that your actuator comes right off so here's what your pin looks like um, it's got a beveled edge here to help you get it started when you put it back in and it's got a uh, little ball uh, detent on it as well uh, when you remove your pin inspect the condition of the pin uh, make sure it's not worn got grooves in it make sure it's good and round also inspect on the actuator the holes where the pin goes into make sure they're not egg shaped so if they're egg shaped you're going to have calibration issues um, because it's not going to be tight on your pin so if you've got egg shaped holes on one side there is another set of holes that you could use so you could uh, really rotate your actuator uh, put your pin on the other holes and that way that'll tighten it up on your spool and also inspect your spool, the hole on it. Make sure it's drilled center and uh, and it's not egg shaped as well. That can uh, cause calibration issues. So that's how we get that one off. This is what the original actuator would have looked like. Um, this actuator mounted on a bracket mounted to the frame and just pinned onto the spool here. It didn't actually mount to the valve. Um, it would just pin on like that and, and a bolt would hold it um, back here on the back side on a, like I said, on a bracket to um, hold it. Um, so on this one, you just remove that pin and unbolt your, uh, from the bracket here and you could take this actuator off. Um, but ever since this original 1999 actuator, the year 2000, they actually changed from this style to, yeah, we don't 
need that to this dial um, that actually bolted to the valve. Um, it mounted flush there and you know just bolted directly to the valve there. Um, and then in 2004, went away from this style and started going to this style. So these two actuators, and again, 1999, then this one ran up till 2004. Um, you cannot buy this style anymore. Um, they will all look similar to this actuator. Um, and if you do have to upgrade to this actuator from this style that mounted flush, then you'd have to get an adapter um, to go with your actuator because your valve would not accept the new style. Where this one mounted flush with an, you would have an O-ring on your valve here and that would mount flush like that. Now, instead of mounting flush with an O-ring, we have an O-ring on a lip here that fits inside the valve. And it'd look like that. So if you're upgrading to this style, uh, just uh, remember that you will need an adapter. Um, on the original style actuators, um, we used a variable resistance potentiometer. Well, let's back up a little bit. Okay. All actuators from 1999 all the way to present day, 2020, Epstein didn't kill himself, COVID-19 is a hoax. Uh, all actuators used five wires. Um, you got two motor wires and three wires for your sensor. And um, the sensor is a position sensor and that's how the, uh, the controller knows where in the stroke it is. Um, so back to the original, we used a variable resistance potentiometer um, that is all potted into the end here. So it's, it's really non-serviceable. You can't get into it. Um, uh, one of the failures on these that I've seen with the actual potentiometer side is the wires breaking off out here on the outside. Um, and we can see on the schematic, if we look at it, so this is about a year 2000 773 g uh, here's the tilt actuator here's the lift actuator and on the schematic you can see this is a symbol for a variable resistance potentiometer then in 2004 when the actuators changed it went to a hall effect um, sensor lift actuator tilt actuator and now you can see the motor wires and this is a symbol for hall effect so 2004 Hall Effect up until 2004 Variable Resistance Potentiometer. Um, and then the original style with the potentiometer, um, when you pull the cap off, it would be mounted right there. So when you pull the cap off, here's the gear that drives the potentiometer. And then inside, we've got a belt drive. So motor side, uh, actuator side, and the belt is what drives the actuator piston in and out. Uh, ball screw actuator um, ever since the beginning. Um, so now let's talk about what the actuator is actually doing inside the valve. So now we're going to see what happens um, inside the valve. I've mocked up um, basically the uh, a valve here that um, with a spool this is the exact dimensions of the valve itself and we got a little wire tie right here showing the center position um, your spools are spring centered um, so we could just use a battery I just use a little Milwaukee 12 volt batteries if we wanted to test the motor we could just take your motor leads and see that spring centered but if you you hook it to your battery it just goes full stroke and holds there's no fine adjustment in that so 
That's what the potentiometer is for. Tell us where it's at. So in order to test this, what I got out of the house, this is just a little power supply. Um, I actually have no idea what it came off of. I just found it in a little box of spare wires inside the house. But it's perfect because it's five volts. The machine also uses five volts on this sensor um, for the position sensor. So um, if you can find one of these power supplies, it works perfect. You're actually going to need a five volt reference. If you take the cap off and you have to recalibrate your actuator manually, you're going to need a five volt power supply. So let's get that plugged up. Okay, like I said, we got three sensor wires. Red is your five volt input. Um, it'll be a red and a green wire always. Your green wire is your signal, your reference voltage. And of course your black with a green stripe or green with a black stripe um, will be the negative for the sensor. So on my five volt power supply, I hook ground to ground, of course, just verify with your meter which one's ground, which one's positive. So ground to ground, five volt input is going to go on the red wire. And then with my uh, multimeter, my red lead is going to go to my green wire because that's my feedback reference. That's what's important to know. Um, my black is going to go to the negative on the sensor okay so we see the center position on all the actuators is going to be about two volts uh, i'm at 2.1 right here but the center position will vary a little bit um so let's, let's run this actuator full stroke that direction it goes to 0 0.05 so that's almost zero that kind of bounced back and forth 2.0 the center in that direction well, that was almost zero. So what happens is we overstroked on this one. That went, that went past the five volts. Um, I think because there's a little flex in the end of this here. So since it's hard to figure out what's going on there, what I've got is um, a servo driver and a motor controller we can use to help position that and it'll give us a better idea of what's going on here. So let me get this hooked up real quick. Okay. So now using our servo driver, we're using pulse with modulation now instead of just running 12 volts to the actuator, now we're using pulse with modulation to use that fine tune. So you can see we come off center position. I just got a little wire tie to kind of to mark. Uh, so that would be the up position. See, we're at 0.4 volts. That would almost be zero on the scale. Center position, 2.1. Now let's go to the down position. Your arms are coming down. Uh, your controller would see about four volts, and that would be the arms coming down full stroke. So that's why our center position is always two volts, because. Um, Zero to two is your up position of the spool. Uh, two to four volts will be your down position. Well, why do we go to five volts? Because on your lift spool, and lift spool only, the tilt doesn't have it, but you have a float position on your valve. So now let's stroke all the way to the float position. See, we go all the way to the five volts, and now we would be in float position. But normally... There's your center position, two volts. Let's raise the arms, 0.4 volts. Center position, down four volts. Now let's go full stroke, float position, five volts. So I do go past, I, I, I kind of roll over the potentiometer because of the little flex in the in our little jig here, but that's how it works. And always spring position. Okay, 
So why is this two volts important? Well, because like I said, that's where the controller sees that center position. And that's why we were talking about if our pin has slop or play in it, you know, this, you can see that the center position varies a little bit. Um, 2.1, 2.2, uh, 1.9. So there is a little play in the center position, but when you install a new actuator, um, that's why it's important to calibrate it because the computer will find out what the end positions are and what that tolerance is in the center position. If you don't calibrate it, it'll be going off the old calibration of the old actuator, which could have um, different tolerance here in the center. You know, it'd be minute, but it could be different and that will reduce the life of the actuator. So it's really important to calibrate your actuators when you have a chance. So how do we calibrate them? All right, now that we see how it works, let's get into the internals of them. All right, first let's talk about this first generation of actuators. We already talked about how it's a belt drive. One of the most common um, failures of this style actuator is usually the, the motor brushes. Um, this is a globe motor, a globe motor attached to a gearbox. Uh, this would be one piece if you were to look up that part number. This is a motor gearbox combination. Um, and then it drives a belt drive. This style gearbox and belt drive is a slower actuator. This is 2.6 um, inches per second where the newer actuators, which call it a flip actuator, is uh, 4.2 uh, inches per second because instead of having motor gearbox, the uh, gearbox is up here, but, but we'll get into that in a minute. So, um, common failures is uh, belt cogs missing, broken belt, um, usually brushes in the motor itself, or the uh, bearing here in the end of the ball screw actuator. But let's just say you had a wiring issue, you already took your top off, um, your actuator where your sensor is well you can't just bolt this back down and and go now you have to recalibrate um, the actuator manually so that you have the center position so this first generation that bolts to the actuator how you're going to calibrate this is you know we can spin the belt here by hand um, we're going to bring the actuator in Actuator piston is going to be flush with the actuator body. So you got to spin that in to right there. I just use my straight edge there to verify it's perfectly flat there. So that's the center position of the actuator. Now we have to tell the computer that's the center position. So using our a five volt power supply again negative negative positive your five volt input to the red wire your signal wire is going to be here so with our multimeter red wire to the signal wire black wire to the ground okay so we're 2.3 volts now. So if I spin the gear on the potentiometer, it doesn't work. Why not? Black to black. Oh, there it is. I think I was touching my red lead. <clears throat> All right. So make sure the wires don't touch and maybe this will be a little easier. <clears throat> okay. So now when I spin my potentiometer, now let me take my range up to the 40 volt. Okay, 3.7, 3.9, five volts. And see, that's what we were talking about earlier at the five volts, if we keep spinning this gear, we go and roll the potentiometer back over to zero. And then we start over again, one volt, two volts. So we wanna get this gear as close to two volts as we can. And then we're gonna insert it to the potentiometer. It drives off this tiny gear here on top of the um, uh, ball screw piston itself. So carefully get it in the right position. So two volts and carefully place this gap back down. 
There we go. We maintained 2.08. That's close enough. I'll go with that. And then we can bolt our head back down. Um, put all our bolts back in. Just verify that you maintain that two volts. Um, and now without a servo driver, which is running a 12 volt battery. 4.8 volts, just verify this. So we deadhead it all the way down, that's zero. And it might roll over here. Yeah, if we go all the way out, it does roll over, but it bounced back a little bit to five volts, so. No worries, okay. So that's how we calibrate first generation actuators. Let's move to the second generation, um, which was this style here. Um, they call this the flip actuator. What does flip stand for? Faster, longer life, improved performance. And that's flip. Um, Bobcat, to this present day, 2020, Bobcat only offers two part numbers for actuators. Um, you have the new style, uh, which is the flip, the faster ones. And then you've got this style, but it's slower. Well, it needs to be slower because, like I said, this first generation of um, actuators with an AHC controller cannot be calibrated or uh, updated or... What's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, I guess it, it can't be updated. So the AHC controller is, is measuring that speed. So if you put a faster actuator in there, it just wouldn't work. So that's why there's only two part numbers. One for the old style AHC controllers and one pretty much takes care of everything else. Um, so how do we calibrate this one? Let's get into one of these real quick. All right, let's try to run through this uh, flip style actuator. Um, three main failures, again, uh, motor brushes, uh, potentiometer, and the bearing on the actuator itself. Um, this is a weather type marine style. Um, a screw right here that we would take off to you know get gain access to our wires and then this cover right here is where our uh, hall effect sensor is i should use some um needle nose pliers and we can loosen that up and back that off either some snap ring pliers or some needle nose pliers and <clears throat> back this cover off and then that'll give us access to our potentiometer. Well, look at that. I guess, can you guess what the failure of this actuator was? See this um, Hall effect sensor, the whole top of it just came off. Could that be fixed? Sure, it could. Um, if this was my machine, I would just epoxy that top right back on that Hall effect sensor. It doesn't matter where you put this sensor on top of that magnet right there. That's a rare earth magnet magnetic field for the hall effect sensor picks up position but wherever you epoxy that back in then we just have to recalibrate it on the inside so that's what um our hall effect sensor looked like from that 2004 all the way up to about 2018 then the hall effect ch sensor changed a little bit um i'll show you that but anyways we pull this cap off um, um and then we can pull the top off this actuator too if we had to what i would do before you take the top off your actuator use that five volt power supply and find out your position on your actuator find out exactly where two volts is just to verify i'm going to tell you but before you take it off you know you can move this actuator piston with a pair of pliers or something i'll see if i can anyways this one I can't but if we get okay we take the top off gear for hollow sex sensor this is where I was talking about we went to a gearbox now um, I can turn it by hand anyways turn the gearbox by hand oh, that center gear does come out you can see we can run our piston out of our actuator Um, so real quick, center position of this actuator when you put it back together will be, yeah, my battery died on my 
meter, but or my dial indicator. But anyways, I've got it set at five millimeters. So the piston right here is going to be five millimeters in from the uh, surface of the actuator here. So I've got my little five millimeter uh, end of my caliper. Put it here. I'm just using my fingers. I'm going to dial that in dead on. five millimeters okay so that's it so I know it's hard to see but yes yeah, so it's five millimeters down from the surface so that's the center position when we bolt it to the valve that's going to be the center position and that's where we will set our uh, two volts on our potentiometer um, center gear comes out uh, there is a washer on the bottom and there'd be a washer on the top uh, make sure you don't lose those but, but this does not have to be clocked um, you know, in in any position, you can put that anywhere, because that's just a driver gear between the motor and the ball screw actuator. So pull that off. There's the three bolts right there for the motor. We can lower the motor down. This outer cover right here, it's got a hex head on it. I've already got it loose. Screw it off. Get access to our motor. Um. There's a red and a black wire. Uh, you can unsolder those. and The, the case is kind of crimped over the back plate. We just take a pair of pliers, bend those crimps back, and we can pull that plate off and get access. We'd have to desolder our wires and get access to our brushes. We could change our brushes like that. You can find still, you can find brushes for this. I haven't been able to really source the actual motor yet. Um, I'm looking for complete motors right now. Um, hopefully if I find one, I'll update the video and, and we'll find it. Um, so this style motor was used after 2006. So um, we went to the flip actuator, 2004, 2006, used a glow motor. And then Thompson started using this motor in 2006, pretty much all the way to, to present day. Um, so three bolts there you can take the motor out that's how you'd get to your brushes you'd have to uncrip the back um, the ball screw actuator it unscrews as well from the body <clears throat> okay so I'm gonna pull this one out but you can see this slot right here. There's a, a little guide in there that'll fall off if you're not careful. That's pinned on. You can see the pin in the body right here and the little guide. It just slides on that pin. So if you pull this actuator out, just be careful that you do not lose that guide. <clears throat> and here's the piston and the ball screw. Um, so like I said, you don't... I never really have a problem with this ball screw. I, I usually spray some lubricant in there, wipe some grease on there. But you don't want to take this part apart because ball screw actuator, you'd almost have to, I'll have to link another video, but the, but the balls kind of feed in. If, if you take it apart, it's going to be very difficult to put back together. Um, what we can do is pull this gear off and pull this bearing off the top, and you can find replacement bearings. That's actually what happened to this actuator. You can see the bottom of this bearing, all the rust coming out of it. But I should be able to just pretty much push down on that bearing and that actuator drive. But since this bearing's bad, I can't do that. Um, I can hold the bearing and spin it by hand, but you can really feel how bad the inside of that bearing is. So that was the failure on, like I said, this actuator. But... Yeah, we can pull this gear off, replace that bearing. I've done it before and <clears throat> works perfect. So that's what the inside, this is the piston. There's the ball screw. Um, pretty much that's all it is for that. Um, inside the tube, there are some wear sleeves inside there. 
Um, I'll pull those out and inspect them, make sure there's no sharp edges or anything on them. And I'll put some grease inside there uh, for the sleeve. Then we'll line up our groove again on our guide. And we can put that back together like that. <clears throat> so I can turn this one back and forth. But that bearing just feels terrible. So that was the ultimate failure of this particular actuator. And then put it back together, just screw it right back into the body. Okay, so we fixed our problem. Let's calibrate this one real quick. We're gonna put our gear back in. Um, we're gonna bring that down again to five, five millimeters. That's perfect. It's right where I want it. <clears throat> Get my gear back in. Okay. And verify. Okay. So that's five millimeters. Okay, th this is one where the cap came off the Hall Effect sensor, but it doesn't matter. Let's just pretend that, I'm push it down in there. Let's just pretend we re-epoxied it and we're gonna put our <coughs> actuator back together. So we're gonna go back with our uh, five volt power supply, positive, positive, negative to negative, multimeter red to green, multimeter black to the sensor black wire okay it gives us five volts and this one's a little more difficult to get lined up than the first generation so that's perfect two volts carefully we've got a gasket in here I've got the gasket taken off but we'd line up the gasket carefully try to get the head of this actuator back down oh man so that maintained two point two point volts i don't always hit it first time i mean sometimes i have to take it on and off move that gear just a little bit in either direction to hold that two volts but man nailed it first time so cool and then we just put some screws in it to put it top back together Let's just use our battery verify that our position sensor is working. You know what? I got a bad motor in this one too. So, you know, it's probably a bad bearing. Um, probably burn out the brushes in the motor. So this one's just bad all over. So anyways, but well, we got the two volts. That's center position, five millimeters in. And that works on actuators all the way up to present day. All right, what else? So we saw the Hall Effect sensor inside this one. We saw what the inside looks like, just a little electronic board, magnet. Um, excuse me. Let's see. Um, here's a actuator from 2019. Pretty much everything's the same. Um, again, you can see we're using the same style motor as this other one. This one is you got a date code. Well, that's 2014. This one's 2019, but pretty much same motor all the way from 2007, 2008 ish. Um, an actuator, like I said, looks exactly the same. The only thing really different in this actuator is the uh, the Hall Effect sensor. I've already got the cap loose here. So check that out. So that's what the circuit board looks like now. Um, it's kind of external, so it's not protected like this other one would have been. It's just kind of out there. 
Let's take it off. Fine. Just two screws hold it on. Same thing with the other hollow fix sensor. They're just two screws holding it on. Um, so I haven't found a source for the actual sensor itself either. But anyways, that's what it looks like. Um, so instead of being the magnet inside the sensor, now the magnet is inside the gear. And so if we ever take this off, there's just a small tolerance uh, when we tighten down our screws. So we'd have to still recalibrate it by hand. So um, what else? I think we've talked about how to calibrate Generation 1, Generation 2, talked about flip actuators, part numbers. There's only two part numbers from Bobcat. <clears throat> uh, we talked about um, our new adapter, if we have to upgrade. We talked about calibrating, uh, machine calibrations. Either Bobcat, the dealership, can do it for you with the computer. Some machines you can calibrate using the joysticks. Uh, should be an operator or service manual for the machine, but... Um, yeah, so even if you fix your original actuator and you put it back in, make sure you run that calibrator or the um, actuator calibration. Um, let's see. I guess the only other thing to tell you is... Okay, yeah, so we got five wires on the actuator, right? Um, three wires for the sensor, two for the motor. Here's the connector, same connector all the way from 1999 to present day. It's a Deutz style connector. Uh, it's an eight pin, but we only use five. So pins one, two, and three. Let's just say if you took them off and you couldn't remember where your wires go, uh, pins one, two, and three. Pin number one is your sensor ground, uh, your black and green wire. Um, pin two is gonna be your green wire, and that's your signal wire. Pin three, that is going to be your five volt input, your red and green wire here. So goes pin one's black, pin two green, pin three red. Um, pin number five is the red motor wire and pin number eight, you can see those two are capped off. Pin number eight is going to be the black motor wire. Pin five red, pin five black. So if we had those reversed, we'd code out from uh, actuator wrong direction. So, <clears throat> all right, so that's how your plug works. Um, inside the plug, you've got a pin retainer. Um, just sits down inside there. So to remove your pins, that's what it would look like on the inside. Just use a pair of pliers, grab your pin retainer, pop it out, and then you'll see the little uh, retainers down in there. You just take a, a sharp pick or something, you just pull back on the tab and your wire will slide right out. And then when you put your wire back in there, just push it up and it's just gonna snap right back into place. Once all you get your wires back in, just put your pin retainer back in and you're done so all right i think that's it thanks for watching um anything else comes up or if you have any questions please let me know in the comments and i'll do my best to answer them um right now i'm still trying to find spare parts for these i've already found some but what i do find i'll share with you all right thanks again hopefully that helped